Well, we are still in the drama of redemption. I think this is the ninth lesson so far in our uh, study. But we're in this place where it's not looking too good. If you just looked at the story as a story of what God is unfolding, how the drama is, un- is playing out, it's really bad news. It's not looking very favorable toward what we call the drama of redemption. Redemption seems far away. Like, this is bad. We're about ten generations in since Adam. About a thousand years. Ten generations in. And the one who we expect to come because God promised Adam and Eve that he would, or he promised Eve he would send someone, one of her seed, to crush the serpent. He said this promise in front of Adam and Eve, but that person has not yet come. Instead, you see corruption in the whole earth. Um, this is what we looked at last time. This is what I believe. I will say it again. I'll read it. Fallen angels have come to the earth and married human women, and they've produced a race of giants called the Nephilim. And their effort was to distort and destroy, uh, distort humanity to the point where what kind of Savior would be able to come from that race? It's messed up. It's so messed up. To the point where God's promise to use the offspring of the woman to crush the Satan, to crush the head of the serpent, would be disabled. You have so many distorted people on the earth, there's no one left to be able to crush his head. That's really what's happening. So let's continue what we're, uh, this drama as we study it. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. The Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal or corrupt. His days will be 120 years. So because of the current conditions that we're in in the earth, Nephilim are on the earth, um, you only got about 120 more years to go. God's going to not contend with man His days are 120 years. It's going to be over in 120 years. The drama is going to end in 120 years. And you go, really, is it that bad? Are you serious? It's that bad? And I'll say, yes, it's that bad. Verse 5 says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. Now remember this verse. Memorize this verse. This is a key verse of the entire Bible. The Lord saw how, God, how great man's wickedness on the earth had become that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. You go, man, it's that bad? What happened to the, what happened to the, the, the people who called on the name of the Lord from Seth's generation, from Seth's family? What happened to them? Where's all the people who called on the name of the Lord? What's going on? Well, no. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart is only evil all the time. This is pretty much everyone alive. I'll go ahead and say it. I think this is everyone alive. There's not a single good thought ever. It says only evil all the time. Not a single good thought ever. Every imagination, every purpose Every desire of the heart of man was evil, corrupt, all the time. That's the nature of man right there. That's a sin nature. That's what sin nature is. It's what total depravity means. Evil is what men do. Evil is what makes men tick. Evil. It's what we do. It's our nature, the nature of man. And and I'm just going to go ahead and do a little theological study here because I want to burn this into our, into our souls. This is how we are. This is what we are. Everyone is alive, and this is what the New Testament describes as missing the mark. In Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, some have said this word missing the mark, or what fall short means, the word sin means, means missing the mark, as if we're somehow aiming at our target and we just missed it. Okay, there's the target over there. So we all take our arrow out, put it in our bow, and shoot toward that target. But nobody's a good shot, so they miss it. That's what we think it means. We're just not good enough to hit it. And the reason why we think that way is because in our minds, in our esteem, in our experience, there are indeed many good people in our lives. 
And by human standards, decent people. Are there not? Am I just making that up? I know some people I think are just decent people. I like them. I don't mind them being my neighbor. Good people. But somehow they just nevertheless fail to please God. They just fall short of his glory and miss it. But I don't want you to misunderstand and I don't want you to confuse um, human goodness or relative human goodness with God's absolute perfection and God's absolute perfect righteous standard. God has this righteous standard that you have to be like that if you're going to be a good person. And yet there are many good people, but it's just sort of relative to everybody else. I'm better than you. You're better than me. I'm better than some, worse than most, that kind of thing. But God's standard is perfection. So don't confuse decent human behavior with what the real problem is, the heart of man. Because the problem is, missing the mark is what sin means. But it's not that we were aiming at the mark and missed it. No one is even aiming at the mark. The mark's over there, we shoot over there. We don't care what the standard is. We want to go the opposite way. Every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil all the time. And this is what the Bible teaches. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful above all things. It's so deceitful... You can't even discern your own heart. You don't even know when you're lying to yourself. You think you did something good. You think somebody's good, but you're deceived. Above all things, beyond cure, you can't fix it. Ecclesiastes 9.3, the heart of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. So while you're living on this earth, this earth, uh, Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes, there's madness in your heart. Evil. That's what's bound up in the heart of man. Psalm 14.3, all have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul quotes that in Romans chapter 3. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 and 23. Jesus said, for from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, Greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Excuse me. All of these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. I mean, that's pretty much every category of evil there is, and it's in your heart. It's, it's what's in a man's heart. And I'll say it's, it's what is in every man's heart. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature, by nature, objects of wrath. What that means is every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil all the time. Genesis puts it perfect. Paul says it again. Titus 3.3, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil all the time. So the drama of redemption started off good. Everything God made was good. Adam and Eve ate the fruit and fell, and they became corrupt, and then all of their offspring became corrupt. It's gone from bad to worse. And now they're Nephilim on the world, in the world, messing up even human nature. Physical human nature. Because I believe there were demons, fallen angels, cohabitating with human women, creating a race of hybrids of demon babies who grew up and were bad dudes, bad people. I'll show you they were bad people. Rampant murder, rampant murder and harm everywhere. All kinds of evil uh, desires and violent activity. Genesis 6, verse 11. Verse 11 through 13. Now the earth 
was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. He probably couldn't walk down the street and give somebody, can't even say hey to a neighbor without him wanting to punch you in the face or kill you. And these Nephilim, if you ran into one of them, they would kill you. Violence. And so God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. The earth is filled with violence. Now, does that sound like a good drama of redemption to you? Sounds like there's no redemption at all. Only violence, only evil, all the time. Corruption, grotesque, a world that has become grotesque. You have people who just say, might makes right. Lamech said, uh, if anyone tries to avenge me, they get seven times what Cain got. How dare you try to offend me? If I can beat you, then I win. Lust, unbelief, that's the norm of the day. You want to know how bad it was? How bad was the drama of redemption? Violence filled the earth. How bad was it, though? Back up a few verses here in verse 6. Remember verse 5 said, every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil all the time. Verse 6 says, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Now that's a puzzling scripture. The reason why that's puzzling because we studied on our very first lesson in the drama of redemption, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Remember that? God is sovereign over everything. God is sovereign over the birds of the air, over the decisions of man. I say what, what, what I say, I determine the end from the beginning. I say what my pleasure is, that will stand. That's what he says. It says God is grieved. He's pained. This doesn't mean that he's realizing he made a mistake because he didn't make a mistake. He never makes mistakes. And he's not up in heaven wringing his hands going, oh, man, this is oh, oh. God's not doing that. God is not regretting the way you and I regret. But he's grieved. He's genuinely grieved. And even though he's sovereign over the drama and over every single decision, every, every cause and effect, every molecule, everything, he's still not the author of sin, and he's not pleased when men sin against him. If you say that, I'm gonna, I might come punch you. God is not the author of sin, and he's not pleased when anybody sins, even though he's sovereign over everything. That's a mystery you just have to live with. But that's the drama we're in. He never changes his mind, and he ultimately is the happiest of all beings, because if he wasn't the happiest of all beings, he wouldn't be God. He's God. Nothing thwarts his purpose and his plan. He is happy, but here he is grieved. He's angry and grieved with the sin of the earth, and he must judge the earth. 120 years, drama's over. 120 years, the drama's over. He's going to judge the earth, and that's not even pleasant to him. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? But 120 years, it's over. God is giving up. That's what it sounds like. He's grieved that he's made man. He's only going to put up with him in 120 more years. He's giving up. It's over. The drama is done. It says it in verse 7. So the Lord said, I will wipe, verse 7, chapter 6, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals, and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. What's that sound like? Read verse 7. I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. And the animals. You know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like this, this drama's over. It's finished. It's done. Does it? Sounds like that to me. 
you picked a bad study, Pastor Mike. Put us in a hole and bring us down. Because this is a downer. God is grieved. I am grieved that I made them. I'm going to finish it. However, except for one thing, God is really not giving up. That's just what it sounds like in verse 7. Because verse 8 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There's only one thing that's going to make anything right. Only one thing ever that will ever make anything right. Whenever you have a, 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 a people on the earth, every single one of us, every single one of us whose every inclination of the thoughts of the heart is only evil all the time, there's only one thing that's even going to remotely kind of in a way sort of fact, fix that. In fact, there's only one thing that will fix that. And it, and it does fix it. Grace. That's what the word favor means. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It means Noah found grace. God put grace on Noah's life. It basically means the Lord liked him. I don't know why the Lord liked him. He just, he just told us, all the people of the earth had corrupted their ways. He just got through telling us every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil all the time. Was Noah any better or different than anybody else? Except for this one thing right here. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It means Noah found grace. Noah received grace. And now I do believe, I really do believe, and I'll say it, I made it sound like Noah's just like everybody else. Noah's not just like everybody else. I do believe he was more righteous than the rest of his generation. But it's not because he was more righteous. It was because he got grace. And if you ever claim to be righteous without grace, you're just a self-righteous hypocrite. You're a Pharisee. Lord, I thank you I'm not like other men. But when you get grace and that changes your life, that's what produces the righteousness, that's different. And that's what's happening here. Noah is more righteous because of grace. And it says in verse 9 through 10, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. See, that's what grace does. Grace that saves is also grace that changes and produces a life of righteousness coming from the heart. No, it says he walked with God. He was more righteous than everybody else, but not because he was more righteous, but because he found favor. He got grace, and grace produces that. I'll show you. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. Paul said, he's given the gospel, but he says, I was one like untimely born. I believe too. He says, I, even though I persecuted the church of God. Now, find me someone out there in the world today who hates the church. You know a lot of people like that, don't you? That's our news. Our news is full of people who hate the church and would love to persecute us, put us in jail, kill us, whatever they want to do. There are people out there who hate the church. These are the worst people on planet Earth. Are they? Would you disagree with me? They're not they're the worst people. They hate God. They hate Christ. They hate his people. That's the way Paul was. Then he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. How did you get from being someone who persecuted the church to being what you are now, an apostle? Grace. No, I, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. I was working. I was serving. The grace had an effect in me. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me, that was with me. It's all grace. It's all grace. It's always going to be grace. It will never be anything but grace. Every righteous act, every good thing you do, every service that you perform for God, no matter how little or how big it is, it will always be by grace. And if it's anything else, it's works. And you'll be judged for that. You don't get any points for that. Only grace. 
Paul says to Titus, uh, chapter 2, 11 through 13, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does grace do? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to live upright lives. But not because we're righteous, but because grace is in us. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. That means God's the one doing this, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. We're saved by grace, and he works in us by grace to do good works. He prepared these works for us to do. It's not because you're righteous. It's because of his grace in you every time. Every time. So Noah was more righteous. Noah, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It's always going to be grace. If you try to make Noah more righteous than everybody else on his own, then you have made a Pharisee out of Noah. And I'm not going to listen to you. It's grace. Even in the drama of redemption, when every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil all the time, and all the people of the earth had corrupted their ways, grace comes and saves one of them and changes him. He's not like them. But he's not like them not because of him, but because of grace. And then Genesis 7. Back to the drama. Then, Noah, then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Again, I'm going to say it, all of grace. No amount of your righteous works will ever win our favor with God. Paul says that in Romans 4.4. 4. When a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. God who justifies the wicked. People who are wicked get justified, and the faith that they had in him gets credited to them as what? Just like Noah. Just like Noah. I have found you righteous in this generation. Who found Noah righteous? God did. You know what that means? That means God is the one who declared him righteous. Romans 11, 5 and 6, so too at this present time, there's a remnant, the, the Israel that was chosen. Most of them were lost. Most of them didn't believe. But now at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, and it is no longer by works, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. So God is going to bring Noah into the ark. So he reveals to Noah what he's going to do and he gives him orders. Here's Noah, here's your orders. For the next 120 years, you have a job to do. You got some skills. We got to put some skills on you and get you working here. There are things you have to do. You have to build an ark, which is a large, what's it called? A ship. Because that would probably be big enough to what? What was it? A boat is, tell me, Joe. A ship is a water vessel big enough to carry another a boat. This was a big boat. This was a ship. Genesis chapter 6, 13 and 14. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and I'm surely going to destroy both men and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress, go for wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. Verse 17. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But then even when he tells no, I'm going to destroy the earth, everything's going to die, he makes a promise. Verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Here's a covenant. I'm going to spare you. You guys are going to go in the ark. And it's not a covenant that depends on Noah. It's a covenant that God says he's going to do. 
Now, Noah has to go build the ark and do the work, but this is God going to spare him. This is God's covenant with Noah. In verse 19 and 20, you are to bring into the, into the ark two of every, all the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. This is the very first mention in the Bible of the word covenant. A covenant is a binding commitment that's binding on all who are concerned with that covenant. God has committed himself. This is God's part of this covenant. God has committed himself to saving Noah and his family. I'm going to destroy everything except you guys. And it's going to happen that way because God has made a covenant. This is God's covenant. This is God's promise. God's going to do this. I will spare you and your sons and your wives and your wife and your son's wife, wives. Now, you know what this is a picture of? This is a picture, when you call it the drama of redemption, this is redemption happening right here. Salvation happening right here. Everybody else is going to die. Everyone else and everything else is going to perish except you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you, Noah. And while we haven't got the offspring of the woman yet who's going to crush the serpent's head, he's still yet to come, this is the fulfillment uh, or a commitment to fulfill that promise to Eve. God made this promise in the garden, and it's all messed up. That promise is virtually ruined in Genesis chapter 6. How is this ever going to happen just like this? God fulfills or this part of the commitment to make that happen. There is a Redeemer coming. There is someone coming who will crush the serpent's head. It's going to happen. And God's going to spare Noah and his family to make sure that happens. And everybody else is going to die. Just so that will happen. We'll study this some more next time because we're out of time today. So um, y'all come back next week and we'll do some more drama of redemption. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your uh, goodness to us to let us come and study your word. To study how you have unfolded for us this picture, this, this story, this, how you're going to save and showing us pictures along the way of how you're going to save. Showing us pictures along the way of how you're going to save according to your grace and by your grace. And by your grace only. And Lord, by your grace you're going to show us, you show us how you're going to draw us to yourself to walk with you and to be righteous in our generation. By grace. And Lord, you're going to show, you've shown us how you're going to save us. Even if everyone else perishes, Lord, you save us. We look forward to the day when we stand before you and we see your son Jesus in person who died for us to redeem us. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that you will bless the rest of our evening and give us safety as we... Do Go home and do our stuff the rest of the week. Bring us back together again Sunday that we may fellowship, worship, study your word again. And be glorified in us between now and then. And after then, I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.